Come home to Jesus. This is the message that Max Solbrechen has proclaimed for 50 years to multitudes across the world. His crusades have taken him to the Hindus of India, Muslims of Pakistan, Buddhists of Sri Lanka, voodoo worshippers of Haiti, Catholics of Malta, and headhunters of northern Luzon. He has preached God's Word in stadiums, churches, tents, universities, and prisons. He comes to you today with the message of God's love and power. The man who is not afraid to preach the truth, Pastor Max Solbrechen. kind of a revision of a talk that I've given several times, which I've called Why Mormonism is a Cult. Uh, this is a slight redirection of that. Actually, it's more than slight. And I'm re-entitling this, Why Mormonism is Not Christian. Because there's a lot of people who don't understand what a cult is. When you say the word cult, uh, they think of some Hare Krishna bouncing around the airport or uh, some wild uh, Satan worshiper or something like that. But I'm often asked, why isn't Mormonism Christian? Now, <clears throat> that's what this whole series is going to be on, the next two meetings. And it's going to be based exclusively, not in my opinion, but on lessons and warnings that we have out of the Word of God. What does the Bible have to say? Well, possibly... One of the most important things I can do in these beginning stages is to answer a question. Why am I doing this? I'm doing this, speaking to you, speaking to others, witnessing to Mormons, because Mormonism is not what it claims to be. It's as simple as that. It's not true. And we have a scriptural lesson in 1 Peter 3.15. I hope you have your Bibles. I've got mine here so we can keep up together. 1 Peter 3.15 says, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. So what I am doing is giving an answer. This is not an attack. You're not going to hear me vilify the Mormon people especially. We will be discussing Mormon doctrine. And there is a big difference, and we must always keep this in our mind, separating the doctrine, the system of belief, from the individual people. Because Mormonism isn't true does not mean that Mormons cannot be good people. They are good people. So we're going to concentrate on doctrine. Okay. <clears throat> now, another question I'm often asked is, why bother? Why don't you just leave them alone? They're sincere. They'll be all right. And as we will see when we get into this further, they're not all right, and why they're not all right. But one of the reasons I think we need to bother is because they're gaining over 600 converts every calendar day of the year. That's enough to fill one Mormon ward for, per day. And well over 95% of these people come from this kind of building. They come from Christian churches into Mormonism. Mormonism does not proselytize the unsaved in the jungles of Borneo, and you won't see any welfare missions down in South Phoenix run by the Mormons, like New Chance or uh, any of these other things, the Salvation Army. You won't see that. They're knocking on your door, trying to get you out of this church into theirs. But most importantly, again, why bother? It's because Mormonism is not true. It cannot deliver the promises that it's made to its people. It's a false system, and it leads people away from the Lord. Mormonism, again, is not Christian. The system is not Christian. Now, that doesn't mean that a Mormon cannot be a Christian. He can be, or she can be. But he or she will be a Christian in spite of that system, by no means because of it. It's in spite of the system. They might have been Christian before they got into it. Or if they're born and raised, they could be a Christian. Because I think it's important for us to establish what is a Christian. We say, I'm saying that Mormonism isn't Christian, but we have to establish what is a Christian. A Christian 
is a noun. It's not an adjective. So often we hear people say, well, that's not a Christian thing to do. Using the word as a, as a description of an action or an attitude. But a Christian is a noun. It's a person who believes what Christians believe. Now, just a few examples of what, Christ, what a Christian would believe. It doesn't have to be a Baptist or a Methodist or a Presbyterian, but a Christian, in other words, you have fellowship with people who are Christians because you believe the same thing. Or you might differ on, have different opinions about different minor things, but on the majors, we agree, and we have fellowship one, one with another. For example, the triunity of the Godhead, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in their nature. That Jesus is the incarnation of God himself, man and God at the same time. The virgin birth, that Jesus was born of a virgin. Salvation by grace, not of works, lest any man should boast. That the nature of man is fallen. And uh, another example would be that the Bible is the word of God and is trustworthy. Okay. Now, I said that Mormonism isn't Christian. Quickly, let me give you some examples. They don't believe what we believe. The reason I am no longer a Mormon is because I don't believe anything that the Mormons believe. Their view of the Godhead is not the triune nature of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's three gods, and two of the three are married that Jesus is only a God. He's one of God's sons. So are we. He's not God incarnate as defined by the Christian church for 2,000 years. The virgin birth doesn't happen in Mormonism, and we'll explain later what it is. Salvation is by works. Grace only assures you physical resurrection. Anything beyond that, and everybody gets that. Everybody gets resurrected whether they like it or not, regardless of what their life has been like. <clears throat> the nature of man is not fallen. The nature of man is that we are God in embryo, future God. That's the nature of man, that we are inherently good, not inherently rebellious and fallen. And that the Bible is very much an insufficient guide there are many mistakes in it. Many precious and plain parts have been taken out of it. It's been mistranslated, and you can, you can hardly trust even one verse in it. So we see that they have redefined, essentially, common terms. And when you've done that, you can't communicate anymore. Okay, now what does the Scripture say about all of this? I'm going to go through and give 20 biblical principles and warnings that we have from the Bible against error, and apply them to Mormonism. I could make the list 50 or 100, but 20 should be sufficient for anyone. Now, turn in your Bible to Deuteronomy chapter 13. Deuteronomy chapter 13, beginning at verse 1. If there arise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder come to pass whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods which thou hast not known, and let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God proveth you to know whether ye love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. And it goes on to explain that that prophet shall be put to death. All right. Even though a prophet has signs and wonders, can perform miracles, change water into wine, walk on the water, whatever it is, fly through the air with the greatest of ease, like the TM people now are getting into levitation, can do things supernaturally, but teaches a different God, changes the nature of the God of this Bible, and says, this is the true God, God says, false prophet. Now, in Mormonism, we have them, again, using Christian terms, saying, well, we believe in God the Father, but their God the Father is no more than an exalted man, just like I am a man now. He was once a man, lived on a planet someplace, was born, lived, 
sinned, died, was buried, eventually was resurrected and rose to the station of godhood. And he's God over us. But you see, their God has a God over him. And that God, who's over our God, has a God over him. And it goes back on and on infinitely. It's called the fallacy of infinite regression, that our God has a God. That's the God of Mormonism. That's, the not, that's not the God of the Bible. That's not the Lord God of Israel. So it, they teach a false God. We have another warning right out of Christ's own mouth in Matthew 24. Matthew 24, verse 5. <clears throat> this is point number two, false Christ. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. This is just one verse out of about eight that we could select. If you look up in your Strong's Concordance, you can find many of them yourself. Second Corinthians chapter 11 and several others about false Christ and deceitful workers. There are many who say that they are Christ himself. Uh, Reverend Moon says that. And a lot of the gurus out of the East say that. Now, Joseph Smith never said that about himself, but he has a false Jesus. The Jesus of Mormonism is not the Jesus of Christianity in the Bible. Now, this Jesus that they have was born, physically born, in a spiritual state. And when I say physically born, he was born of a sexual act between God the Father and God's senior wife, eons ago in a pre-existence. That's what the Mormons mean when they call him the firstborn. They mean that, that he was the first one born in a pre-existent state millions and millions of years ago. And the only difference by nature between Jesus and anybody in this room is a matter of degree. See, because we are all gods in embryo. We can all become God. He has already become a God. You see, he's a God. The first one born in this pre-existence. When he was born in Bethlehem some 2,000 years ago, he was not begotten of the Holy Ghost. He was not born of a virgin. His birth was effected through physical intercourse between God the Father. And remember, God the Father is a man with a physical body and everything, and Mary. Because if he was born of the Holy Ghost, he'd be the son of the Holy Ghost, because remember, they have three gods. They have three gods. So if he was born of the Holy Spirit, then he would be the son of the Holy Spirit, not the son of the Father. So he was not born of a virgin because God the Father had sexual relations with Mary in order to impregnate her. And this same Jesus that they have, when he lived on the earth and died on the cross, what did he pay for? Christianity, we know the message well. He paid for my sin and your sin. But in Mormonism, their Jesus only paid for the sin of Adam. The sin of Adam. And by doing that, he assures everyone of physical resurrection because physical death came from Adam. So life comes from Christ, physical life. But anything beyond that, and there's a lot beyond that, in Mormonism. You have to earn. And how do you do it? By keeping their laws, paying your tithe and going to the temple and so forth and so on. So that's what their Jesus did on the cross. That's not my Jesus. And that's how I became a Christian. I knew the Jesus that I had as a Mormon. I knew what he had did, had done, and what he hadn't done. And when I heard the message three years ago of who Jesus really is and started checking what these people were saying, I was reading testimonies of modern Christians. And I'd never heard this message before, not that I could remember anyhow. And when I checked it in the Bible, I found out that what they were saying was true. And all I did was compare the Jesus I had as a Mormon with this other Jesus, and there was no comparison. And I renounced Mormonism and accepted Christ. So this is their Jesus, and that's a different Jesus. That's not the Jesus of the Bible. So they have a false Christ. Now, they also have a false Holy Spirit, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And I highly recommend 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 
in dealing with the false teaching of Christians founding but Christ denying religion. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 3. But I fear, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel which you have not accepted, you might well bear with him. Paul was warning Corinthian Christians to watch out for these false teachers with their different Jesus, different spirit, and their different gospel, that they might well go along with them. You know, I find as Christians explore and study Mormonism, they start scratching their head and they say, how could any Christian possibly believe that? but they do. Born-again believers get sucked into these false doctrine systems, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, and the rest of them. And that's why Paul was warning the Corinthians. He was warning believers to watch out for this. So don't think it can't happen just because somebody has been born again. Okay, now we have another uh, verse right in the same chapter, warning us against false angels, that's number four, and false ministry. Excuse me. Verse 14. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, who then shall be according to their work. They can really look good, especially to the untrained eye. I have many people say to me, well, Mormons are such nice people. And essentially, they are. What's wrong with them? There can't be anything wrong with them. In fact, my Mormon neighbor is probably a better, quote, Christian, unquote, than I am. I point to this verse for a lesson from God. That the outward appearance to you and I can be tremendously deceptive. You know, we can see something that looks like a beautiful white marble statue I mean, just magnificent. You go up and touch it, and you can lift it with one hand. Why? Because it's made out of styrofoam. But on the outside, it looks like the real thing. But on the inside, it isn't. It's the same way with those who don't have a relationship with the living Jesus. On the outside, we can look good because the system forces conformity out of them. You know, don't smoke, don't chew, don't go with girls who do. You know, pay your tithing, wear short hair. You know, do this and do that and don't do this and don't do that. Okay, extremely legalistic. So they appear to be fine. And the world looks at them, you know, in their beautiful choir and, and all these young men with their short hair and their hearty handshake. But inside there's dead men bones. That's what Jesus said about the Pharisees. And when we're dealing with Mormonism, we're dealing with a modern-day Pharisee. And in fact, if you want your eyes opened up and you really want to understand what Mormonism is all about, get your concordance and look up every reference to the Pharisees. And you will have an understanding of Mormonism from the best source in the world, the Bible. Because that's what they are. But on the inside, they're not regenerated. They're dead on the inside. They look all right on the outside. And the problems that they have, and they have just as many problems as any other large group in the world, of crime, homosexuality, murder, suicide, drugs, all that kind of stuff. Statistically, they're no better than any other four million people in the world. They hide it better. They bury it. They ship off their young people who are causing trouble. There's a tremendous amount of peer pressure. So the Mormon that you see who lives nearby you, who's active, looks very good to you. But don't let those appearances be deceptive. Because the most important thing is, who is the God that they have? And what is their relationship to Christ? Okay. <clears throat> False apostles. You know, Mormons claim to have 12 apostles. And they'll ask you, well, where are your apostles? We have 12 of them. What you want to ask them is, are they true apostles? 
we get a lesson from Revelation chapter 2. Revelation 2, verse 2. This is Jesus speaking. I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and hast found them liars. This is what we're to do when somebody claims apostolic authority is to try them or in modern English test them. How many of you know what the criteria are from the Bible in order to be an apostle of Jesus Christ? I venture very few. One is that you have to be a witness of Christ's ministry on earth and a witness of his resurrection. There's nobody that I know of who's alive today who witnessed his earthly ministry or his physical resurrection in Jerusalem. And there are many other tests that can be applied to prophets and apostles. And when you test Mormon apostles against these criteria, we find them to be liars. They are not apostles of Jesus Christ. In fact, there's an excellent little booklet uh, written by James Bales, I think it was, called Apostles or Apostates. Something like that. We have, uh, I have one copy down at the store. We don't carry them. Uh, we only have so much shelf space available. And it's really tremendous, about 60 pages, and it just really goes into real depth on what the apostolic authority had to be and the criteria for being an apostle and why Mormon apostles are not true apostles. But there are false apostles. Mormons aren't the only ones who have false apostles. There are a number of other groups who are claim to have apostles as in the days of old. <clears throat> Number seven, probably the most important in this regard of uh, the ministers is false prophets. We learn a good lesson from Matthew chapter seven. Again, the Lord speaking. And this is one that you will find Mormon missionaries using. Verse 15, Matthew 7. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruit. Verse 16. And then it goes on and gives several examples of what fruit can come from a good tree versus a bad tree. And then he reiterates again in verse 20. Wherefore, by their fruit, you shall know them. The Mormons are very quick to point out their fruit. Short hair, nice kids, good family life, good choir, trustworthy, good neighbors. That's all well and good, but that's not what Jesus was talking about. Let's take a look again. Beware of false prophets which come to you in what? Sheep's clothing. What is a sheep? It's an obvious type figure that most of us are very familiar with. That signifies the believer, the people of God, the Jews in the Old Testament and the Christians in the church age. So what is Jesus saying? They're going to look like sheep, but they're not going to have wool, they're going to have fur, because inwardly they're going to be ravening wolves, and that we shall know them by their fruit. Now, <clears throat> Again, the Mormon will claim this good life that they supposedly leave as their fruit. But that's not the fruit, because we're not talking about the people. We are talking about the prophet. What's a prophet? Very simply, it only has one function in the Old Testament or the New. Thus saith the Lord. It is God's mouthpiece. A prophet is nothing more than a messenger boy. That's all. Celestial Western Union, if you will. This is what God has said. So there's only one fruit a prophet can have. What does he say that God says, and who is this God that he is serving? It's not his lifestyle, no matter how good it might appear to us. Remember the warning we just looked at about being uh, false ministers, that they will look like ministers of righteousness. The first and foremost is who is their God and what does he say? 
Who are they serving? Do they serve the Lord Jehovah? Or are they serving Baal? That's what we have to check first, not the warm smile and the hearty handshake and the outward friendliness. But what is the doctrine of this system? You can have good fruit of life and corrupt doctrine. But just as well as we know that one can have good doctrine and a very corrupt life. You need that balance. You know. But this is what Jesus was talking about, about false prophets. Remember the angel of light. But Satan himself can appear as an angel of light. So we need to check the doctrine. And that's the only function that we need to examine is what is that prophet's doctrine. Okay. <coughs> false gospel. There is a false gospel. In fact, there are many false gospels. Probably the best verse we have in the Bible is in Galatians 1, beginning at verse 6. This is Paul. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, verse 7. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be a curse. Just so we don't miss it, he says it again. Verse 9. As we said before, so say I now again, that if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be a curse. And the Greek word he used here was anathema. That's the divine curse. That's the worst possible thing he could invoke on anybody. If anybody teaches another gospel. Now the word another here means a different one. It's not another of the same kind, it's a different kind. It's just like another Jesus, a different Jesus. Now, the gospel in in the Bible, I don't think I need to expound on that. You probably hear about it every Sunday and Wednesday and other times too in your own devotions and study. But essentially, let me point out one key element of it. You know, the gospel is defined for us by Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the first couple of verses. And that is that Jesus is God incarnate who came, was buried, and was resurrected all according to the scripture. That's the gospel of Paul. If anyone who wants to understand what Paul thought our relationship to that gospel is, I do is read the book of Romans. I often quip that Romans is the gospel for the Mormons. Paul's epistle to the Mormons is in Romans. Because almost every major point that they are in error concerning salvation is discussed by Paul in that book. But the key element of the gospel of Jesus Christ is the blood covenant that God made with man, beginning with Eve, through Abraham, and on down, that God himself would provide a sacrifice to atone for, cover, and take away your sin and mine. The blood covenant. You have to believe in the blood of Jesus Christ and that it has saving efficacy for you personally, or it doesn't avail you of anything. Now, in Mormonism, they have replaced that blood covenant with another covenant that they call the new and everlasting covenant. You know, in the Gospels, it talks about Christ's sacrifice being the new and everlasting covenant. Well, the Mormons have a new and everlasting covenant, but it's not that. You know what it is? The marriage. They replace the blood covenant of Jesus Christ with an eternal marriage covenant. That's what that temple down in Mesa is all about. They go in there and have a marriage performed for time and eternity. Actually, the marriage ceremony only takes about 30 seconds to go through. It's one little short paragraph. And next week, I'll bring some material, including a new book which we've just published called What's Going On Here? The Mormon Temple Ceremony updated to what you're doing today. A lot of people have a lot of weird ideas about what does go on in there, and there isn't anything really strange, okay? But there are some things in there that I think Christians need to know about. And it pertains mostly to this type of thing, the doctrine that they teach in that temple. But that's their prime directive of the ages, is to be sealed to a man or a woman for all eternity. See, because there are no single gods. 
In order to become a god, which is what every Mormon male and female wants to be, god or goddess as the case might be, you have to be married in the temple. You have to be married by their priesthood for time and all eternity. Or forget it. You just become an angel, a ministering servant to minister to those who are far worthy of more than you and those of God. Mormons really do believe that they're going to become God. They really do believe that. They may not admit it to you, see, because they don't give the meat of the gospel, quote, that's the Mormon gospel, to the unbeliever. They wait until you get into the system. But they really do believe that. They really do go along with the lie that Satan told Eve in the garden and for the reason for his fall in Isaiah chapter 14, because he wanted to be a God. He wanted to be like God. And that's not true. You cannot become a God. This false revelation that we are warned against in Jeremiah 23, 25. Jeremiah chapter 23, 25 to verse 27. I have heard what the prophets said that prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed a dream. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor, as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. There is false revelation. Just because somebody comes saying, Thus saith the Lord, doesn't mean it's from God. In fact, the Jews were instructed very specifically on what to do whenever anybody did come in the name of the Lord. Jeremiah chapter 23, 25 through 27. <clears throat> now, I don't think for one second that God cannot give us more revelation. So don't fall into that trap, because God can do it, merely because he's God. The point is, when somebody says that this book or that book is from God, then you've got to test it. And I haven't seen anything yet that's passed the test other than the Bible. There's no new revelation that I can see on the uh, scene today that has, in fact, come from the Lord God. But he is going to send us some prophets, don't forget that, as he did in the days of old. He's going to send two prophets during the tribulation. Because he's again going to be dealing with Israel as he did in the days of old. So the time will, will come when somebody will be able to say, To the world, thus saith the Lord. So it's not that God cannot speak, he can, and he probably will, as I understand the book of Revelation. But test all things. Hold fast to that which is good. And that includes anything that purports to be revelation from any place. You know, it's interesting. <clears throat> I hear a lot of Christians say, well, there can't be any revelation because of what it says in Revelation. Chapter 22, verses 18 and 19. Revelation 22 Verse 18, For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And then verse 19 says, If anybody takes away, that will be taken away out of his part of the Lamb's book of life. And they say, See, it's right there at the end of the book, and you can't have any more scripture. Well, that's insanity. Because the book, as we know it, wasn't compiled for several hundred years. So that's not necessarily the last thing that was written down. Besides, in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 2, it says almost the same thing. You don't take away or add to what God has said. You don't take away or add to from the book of Revelation, or from James, or from the Gospel of John, or from Deuteronomy, or anything else. Now that's the proper meaning of that verse. It doesn't mean that there can't be more scripture. But if anybody comes saying that thus and so is Scripture, then we want to test it against what Scripture has already said. <clears throat> now, there are false secret teachings. False secret teachings. We learn a lesson from Jesus himself in John chapter 18. John 18, verses 20 and 21. Jesus answered him, 
I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort, and in secret I have said nothing. Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me. What I have said unto them, behold, they know what I have said. Jesus never taught anything in secret, and in secret he said nothing. But in the Christian-sounding but Christ-denying religion, the cult, Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses, Hare Krishna, the Moonies, and a long list of the rest of them, they all had these secret inner teachings that only the initiated can know. That's what the Mormon learns in his temple and other places. And the Jehovah's Witnesses have a special meeting once during the week that only strong Jehovah's Witnesses can go to because there they get their secret internal teaching that the world is not worthy to receive. Now these secret teachings are almost always, or I can say they're always, against the gospel of Jesus Christ. When you take a look at the Mormon temple ceremony, you can see that for yourself. Another thing that you'll find is that Mormons won't tell you what they really believe. Now I'll tell you what I believe as a Mormon. And I can document everything that I say, and I'm willing to do so. And in fact, next week I'll have some books here with some very, very good documentation in them. The Mormon will say, well, I don't believe that, or we don't teach that, or boom, 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 down the line. And he's standing there, and he's lying to you. He knows that he believes that, but he knows how you react to that, and he will not tell you the truth. It's what I call... Lying for the truth. Lying for the truth. That the end ju does justify the means. Do whatever you can to get them into the church, and then they'll grow from there. Oh, don't tell them if it's going to bother them about the fact that God lives on the planet called Kolob. That's a thousand miles. Uh, a day on the, on the planet Kolob is like a thousand years on earth. That he's about six feet tall and has white hair, and he looks exactly like Jesus Christ. Because after all, they're father and son. And that, that God the Father must have at least 701 wives and 301 concubines. Because Solomon had 700 wives and 300 concubines. And you can't tell me for one instant that Solomon is going to have more wives than God the Father. Or that Jesus was the one who was married at the marriage of Cana. And that the two Marys and Martha were in fact his bride. See, this type of thing isn't brought out. This is that secret inner circle teaching that the world doesn't see. You know, you could call the Mormon missionaries to your house and go through all eight lessons and learn about 2% of basic Mormon doctrine because that's all you're going to get. You see, because the Mormon missionaries aren't sent out to teach the people of the world Mormonism. They are sent out to make converts to the Mormon church. And so their whole program is structured to get you into the church, not to teach you what they believe. They don't. It's what they call the meat of the gospel. You don't give out the meat of the gospel until the person has developed well on the milk of the gospel. And that is telling you as little as possible in order to convince you to get into the Mormon church. <coughs> We have a problem of false evangelism, false, what I call false evangelism or sheep stealing, sheep stealing. We learn a lesson from Romans chapter 16, Romans chapter 16, verse 17 and 18. <clears throat> this is again Paul. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches deceive the hearts of the simple. What we have in Mormonism is 25,300 young men and women trying to get you out of this church into their own 
by telling you as little as possible about what Mormonism really teaches in order to get you baptized. And if that isn't causing divisions, I don't know what is. Now, I'm often asked, why do people join? Why do Christians or semi-Christians or nominal Christians or people who have some sort of understanding about Christianity, why do they join the Mormon Church or the Jehovah's Witnesses who actually uh, are outgrowing the Mormons? You learn a very, very good lesson in Proverbs. Proverbs is a neat book. Know that there's 31 Proverbs. That's one for every day of the year or every day of the month, a few spares in February. You go through Proverbs enough time, you get so smart, probably have to learn to be humble again. But in Proverbs 27, verse 7, Solomon says, The full soul loatheth a, a honeycomb. Here's the important part. But to the hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. And that's true. I tell you, 13 years ago, I had a hungry soul. I was looking for answers. You know, the Mormons come along and they, they have answers for almost everything. They really do. You can ask them all kinds of questions and they got answers. I'm not saying that they're good answers, but they're answers. And you should know that the world is looking for answers. You know, the next project I'm going to work on is a little booklet. I'm calling it if you think Mormonism is the answer, you ask the wrong question. Or what the Mormon missionaries didn't tell you because they probably didn't know it themselves. Now that's true. People ask the wrong question. Why do they ask the wrong questions? Because the missionaries manipulate them to ask the wrong question. They're in total control of the encounter with any prospective convert. And I mean total. So. When I'm teaching Christians to witness to Mormons, I concentrate on questions. Now, Gene knows that in watching me uh, witness to a Mormon. Actually, I didn't preach to him. I didn't try to tell him this, that, or the other. I just kept asking him questions. But they were good questions, and they were right on questions. And they were important questions that everybody needs to know the answers to. And I told him to answer them for himself, not for me, because I already knew the answers. But people are joining because the Mormons are coming with some answers. Well, they're not particularly good, and this proverb says that any bitter thing is sweet. When you're starving to death spiritually, and somebody comes along with a spiritual reality, it really tastes good. Man, there's something special about those people. There's something spiritual about them. There is, by and large. There is a spiritual reality in Mormonism, but that doesn't mean it comes from God. I'd like to answer one more question, and that is why do Christians leave Christian communions to become Mormons? Now remember, we discussed the fact that Mormons proselytize Christians. They don't go after the unsaved. You won't see any salvation missions down in South Phoenix or on any other town's skid row or Mormon missionaries riding bicycles out in the jungles of the Amazon or other places, climbing mountains to find the unsaved. They're after you and I. We do learn one thing from Scripture that I find very important. It's in 1 John, 1 John chapter 2, 1 John 2, verse 19. And it says, They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would, no doubt, have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. Well, quite simply, or in plain English, that's saying that some people take off because they were not real in the first place. That's a very loose, witty paraphrase of King James English. And this is, by and large, the case in many instances where alleged Christians join in with these uh, groups, these Christian-sounding groups that aren't Christian at all. Mormonism, Jehovah's Witnesses get involved in the occult and the drug scene and so forth and so on. 
Because there is a spiritual hunger that is in almost everybody. Well, I'll say it. It is in everybody. There is a spiritual drive in there. And there are spiritual realities in these organizations, but it does not mean that that spiritual reality is necessarily from God. And I also believe that a truly born-again Christian can simply just be deceived into it. So don't be quick to say just because somebody leaves a Christian communion who has claimed to be born again was not really born again merely because they became a Mormon or a Jehovah's Witness. Remember the warnings that we had in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 about uh, watch out for these false teachers who come to you with another spirit and another Jesus and another gospel because you might well bear with them. That means you Christians watch out. You know, it's not for nothing that the Lord calls us sheep. You know, he talks about my sheep and I'm the good shepherd. That's because sheep are really dumb. And Christians can be awfully dumb and do awfully dumb things sometimes. I think every one of us is guilty of that. So I think that's a good type figure for us. Now our next, uh, next point is a very important one. It's one I call false discipleship. False discipleship. And our lesson comes out of Luke chapter 22, verse 25. Let's turn to that. Luke 22, beginning at verse 25. And he said unto them, The kings of the Gentiles exercise lordship over them, and they that exercise authority upon them are called benefactors. Verse 26, But ye shall not be so, but he that is greatest among you, let him be as the younger, and he that is chief as he that doth serve. All right, here the Lord is telling us that the Gentiles lord their authority over one another. Go here, go there, do this and do that. And we can learn a good lesson from this. And there's also a parallel passage, we won't go to it now, in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 4, that uh, says essentially the same thing about the control of one's life by those, quote, in authority, unquote. Control is the key word. Now, anybody who is familiar, and I say really familiar, with the Mormon system has to realize very quickly how much control that they have over their people. That they, in this case, would be the bishops, the state presidents, and the general authorities of the Mormon church. They tell them what they can eat and what they can't, when they can eat it and when they can't, who they should marry and who they shouldn't, and when they should marry and when they shouldn't. And uh, uh, when they're on a mission, when the young boys and young girls are on a mission, the mission rule book must be as thick as a, as a dictionary. They tell them when to get up, how long to have for breakfast, when to go out, what days to go knocking on your door, how to do this, how to do that, when to eat supper, when to come home. They can't leave any later than 9.30 or they turn into a pumpkin or something. And on and on and on it goes. This is what I call the control of life. And in the uh, epistle to Timothy, we get this warning about forbidding to marriage, to marry, forbidding to eat meats and so forth. And it goes on and talks about the control of life. Now, if your pastor here got up and started to tell you some of the things that the Mormon bishops uh, tell their people, uh, he wouldn't be around much longer. Because you can't understand the control that a bishop has unless you've lived under it. I'll give you a good example. Every December, every Mormon has to go in and talk to his bishop and prove to him, to the bishop, that he, the Mormon, is a full tithe payer. Or he is put down as a partial tithe payer and doesn't have his, has his uh, temple recommend taken away from him. You have to go in and prove it to him. And then in January, you get your... Uh, well, I can't call it anything else but your bill for what you are expected to pay during the next year above and beyond your tithing money for ward maintenance and cleanup funds and office supplies and so forth and so on. Uh, I remember the last one that I got was for myself, considered a single member because my wife was not a member, my bill was 168 bucks over and above tithing. And that this would uh, essentially fall into the category of, of priestcraft. 
Now, it's not a dirty word, and it's, it's a very biblical word, and we get a lot of warnings about it in the Bible, throughout the Bible. This is where the religious leaders control the life of the people. This is the lesson we learned from the Pharisees. You know, they kept pointing the finger at Jesus about breaking the Sabbath. But that wasn't the case at all. If he broke anything, it was the rules of the priestcraft class, the Pharisees. The doctrines of men, the commandments of men, not the commandments of God. And out of this, you'll find, and you know this if you know Mormons, that there is a total commitment to the church, not to Christ, but to the church demanded of each and every member. And when you think about your conversations with your Mormon friends, reflect on how much they talk about the church, the church, the church, as opposed to Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. When you're witnessing to somebody, you don't talk to them about the church, you talk to them about the Savior, Jesus, and what he has done in your life, and what he means to you, and what he wants to mean to them. There is the big difference. Okay, our next point is an interesting one about false teachers. Now, we talked about false prophets, but we also have a problem with false teachers. And from Second Peter, the second epistle of Peter, chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. Second Peter, chapter 2, verse 1. But there were false prophets also among the people, even as shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them, and bring upon themselves swift destruction. Swift destruction, of course, is King James for sure destruction. Now, I believe that a false teacher is almost as bad as a false prophet because the end is the same thing. A false teacher will lead you away from the Lord your God. Now, notice that this verse says something very important and we tend to look it over, overlook it. It says, even denying the Lord that bought them. Now, this is a point I was trying to make earlier about the different Jesus of Mormonism. These people are taught that all that Jesus did on the cross was pay for Adam's transgression in the garden. Jesus did not pay for their transgressions, their individual sins. His blood does not wash their sins away. This is a clear example right here of denying the Lord that bought them. They deny the efficacy, the saving efficacy of the blood of Jesus Christ, these false teachers. Now, <clears throat> we learn another lesson from 2 Thessalonians concerning false miracles. False miracles. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning at verse 9. Even him whose coming after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. There's your false miracles. And with all deceivableness, verse 10, of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, this cause being that they did not have the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Now, there are false miracles. We learn a very good lesson in the Old Testament. Remember the instance with Moses and the magicians of Pharaoh? And they bit about the stick thrown down on the ground, becoming a snake, and then the magicians duplicated that, however they lost because Moses' snake ate theirs. And they went on and duplicated other miracles, supernatural happenings, to a point. To a point. The false prophets and the agents of Satan can duplicate the, duplicate the supernatural of God to a point. Now, 
Notice that uh, there's an interesting thing here in uh, verse 11. And it says here, And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. Now, a lot of times I have difficulty with people who do believe because of ignorance that Mormonism is Christian. There was an interesting uh, editorial not too long ago in the church news concerning this very verse about strong delusions. Now they said that uh, the strong delusion, one of the strong delusions today is that confession of Jesus Christ as both Savior and Lord is a lie. The gospel does not provide for salvation by that means in spite of what the Bible says. That, to them, is a strong delusion. That accepting Christ as your Savior is what gains you salvation. That is not Christian. That is Antichrist. And the lesson we need to learn from this, from Pharaoh, and from the other examples that we have in the Scripture, is very simple. Just because something is supernatural does not mandate that it is from God. Just because it's beyond the powers of the natural doesn't mean it comes from God. We've got the examples of psychic surgery, healings, people uh, having bones put back and so forth and so on, and it's all occultic and admittedly so by the people who were involved with it. The Lord Jesus is not involved in that kind of activity. So supernatural, don't let it impress you. Check it against the ruler, the Word of God. If it doesn't measure up to this ruler, then throw it out. Now we also, and this is all tied together in a similar vein, have many false spirits. And Mormonism has a false spirit about it. Let's turn to 1 John. 1 John chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Beloved, notice he's talking to Christians. Believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they be of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. And then he goes on and gives us one of the tests that we can use. The point here is that there are many false spirits out in the world and that we do need to test them. Again, the only safe and sure ruler guideline measurement that we can use is God's holy word, the Bible. <clears throat> I have noticed in my witnessing encounters, and others have too, a very special thing, and that's when you're dealing with the system of Mormonism, and especially their official representatives, those young boys, 19-year-old, 20-year-old kids out on their bicycles, remember, they are not ministers of righteousness. They do represent the powers of darkness. Not that they themselves are the powers of darkness, but they are being used by those powers. And time and again, this has happened to me and to others who have gone in and done a lot of witnessing, that if you pray the prayer of faith and take your authority, if you are in fact a child of God, born again, blood-bought, blood-washed Christian, take that power that you have, that authority, over the spirits that are manipulating these young boys and pray this prayer that you ask God to bind those spirits that might attend them. And I'm not saying that every one of these boys is demon-possessed. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the powers of darkness that are trying to use them. If you bind those spirits before you witness to them, you will see an entirely different kind of encounter. And you can do it quickly as you go reaching for your front doorknob because the bell just rang and there's somebody out there. And time and again this has happened, and this is one of the reasons that for the last year and a half or so I have never gotten into an argument with a Mormon, even being an, um, an apostate like myself. The Spirit of God just settles down and takes control, and the spirit of contention 
that might accompany them is not present. And it works. But you've got to be a child of God in order to call on that power. Remember the lesson we learned in Acts? You know, Jesus we know, and, and uh, Paul we know, but who are you? So you better know Jesus on a first-name basis in order to use that kind of authority. <clears throat> now, we have something that you will run into each and every time that you do encounter with a Mormon, and that's their testimony. They have a testimony that the, quote, gospel, that's the Mormon gospel, is true. We learn a lesson about testimony from the Bible in Isaiah chapter 8. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. Now it's talking about uh, the powers of darkness and uh, those that have familiar spirits and wizards and so forth. But verse 20 sums it up very nicely. It says, To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. So the fact that somebody testifies to you, no matter how strongly or sincerely, if they don't speak according to this word, the word of God, it is because there is no light in them. Now they come to you and they say, well, we would want you to read the Book of Mormon and pray about it. If you pray with, with a sincere heart, with real intent, having faith in Christ, then he will manifest by the power of the Holy Ghost the truth, truthfulness of it to you. They ask you to pray about it. In fact, they make you feel guilty about it if, if you don't want to pray about it. But you know, that's the wrong thing to do. In fact, that's probably one of the worst things that you can do, is pray about the Book of Mormon or Joseph Smith being a prophet. Now, the reason it's the worst thing you can do is because it's diametrically opposed to the instructions of God. Or not that we're not supposed to pray, okay? We are. But we're not supposed to pray about books being scripture or men being prophets. In fact, you can turn this one around on, on, on the Mormon and ask them, well, have you checked out the Koran or the Bhagavad Gita or Mary Baker Eddy's scripture book Science and Health with Key to the Scriptures, or the writings of Baha'u'llah, or Buddha, or anybody else, and you'll always get a no. Well, no. Well, how do you know that they're not Scripture, too? And maybe better Scripture than the Book of Mormon, or the Bible. No, you won't find them praying about those. They just want you to pray about the Book of Mormon. Now, why shouldn't I pray about the Book of Mormon? Now, what kind of reasonable answer can you give them? the only scripture that they can ask you to follow is out of context. It's in James, the first chapter, verse 5. Let's take a quick look at that. James, the first chapter, verse 5. Because this is a very important point because they come to you all the time and they quote this to you. Verse 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Sounds great, you know, ask of God and so forth and so on. But it's totally out of context. When you read the context of James chapter 1, you find out that he's telling us to hang in there when we're going through trials and tribulations. And if you're having a tough time toughing it out, seek God's wisdom to understand why these things have come into your life and how God is going to use them for his glory. That's the context. And notice it says wisdom. Now, there is a difference between wisdom and knowledge. I think there's a big difference. I've never had a Mormon look at me and say with a sincere look in his face, I have wisdom that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God. No, they all claim supernatural knowledge. I know that Joseph is a true prophet. Okay, so that's the only verse that I know of that they can use to try to get you to pray about the Book of Mormon or Joseph Smith. Now again, what's wrong with it? Well, let me show you by a little analogy that I think is very effective, and you can use this with your Mormon friends. You tell them that you cannot pray about it. You cannot pray about it because it's against the instructions. You know, we quip about when all else fails, read the instructions because we've made a mess of everything. You go find out how to do it right. 
Well, that's what the Bible is, a set of instructions for us, and it's very, very specific. Now, here's how you prove it to them. You look at them and you say, let's say that you decided to pray about a certain thing, and you've got a positive answer to that prayer, like you're guaranteeing me that I will get if I pray sincerely, because you prayed sincerely about this problem with a sincere heart, having faith in Christ, with real intent, you really weren't trying to fake out the Lord, and you got a positive answer. And the problem that was puzzling you is if you wanted to know from the Lord if it was all right for you to commit adultery with the bishop's wife. And you got a positive answer to that. Now, did that positive answer come from God? And I've used this a couple of times, and I've always had a universal, well, no, certainly not. Why not? Well, it says right there in the Bible, thou shalt not commit adultery. And I say, amen. The wicked one was trying to, de to deceive you. Even though you were sincere with faith and real intent, he was trying to deceive you because the word of God says you shall not commit adultery. And I look at them and I say, you know what? The word of God also tells us very specifically what we should do when somebody comes saying, Thus saith the Lord, or that a book is scripture. We are to test all things and hold fast to that which is good, and to apply the prophet's test to Mormonism. Test number one would be in Deuteronomy chapter 13. We already discussed that about if he comes and teaches a strange God that you should not follow along with him, even though he has signs and wonders. And also, probably the best test of all, the easiest one to apply to anybody who claims to be a prophet of God, is in Deuteronomy chapter 18 at verse 20. Let's take a look at that. This is a very important point. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 20, <clears throat> because it's talking about a prophet. But the prophet, which shall presume to speak a word, notice that, a word, in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. That's the penalty for false prophesying in the economy of, of Israel. And verse 21, And if thou shalt say in thine heart, How shall we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? Verse 22, When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing, notice that, the thing, only one thing, okay? If the thing follow not nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken, but the prophet has spoken it presumptuously, and thou shalt not be afraid of him. That is one really good test for a false prophet. Did he ever, ever, ever say anything in the name of the Lord that didn't come to, come to pass? You know, you can be right 999 times and miss the one. And that makes you a false prophet. You know, you only have to lie once to become a liar. And you only have to steal once to be a thief. You only have to have one false prophecy to be a false prophet. That's why you should not pray about the Book of Mormon or Joseph Smith being a prophet of God. You're going against God's instruction. He has told us what to do, and this is only one of several prophets that he has told us what to do. Now, what does this result in? This testimony that they have that is so strong to them. And it's a spiritual experience, and I won't deny the reality of it. The only thing I deny is the source of it. You know, the burning bosom that they talk about, that doesn't necessarily come from God. I see too many examples of where Satan can inflict physical feelings upon us. Look what he did to Job, hair falling out, boils. You think a little warm feeling in the chest is going to be hard for them? No. But they've been programmed when they get that warm feeling, that's God speaking to them. But nowhere do I find that in the Bible. It results in a false zeal. And boy, do they have some zeal. Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, beginning at verse 1. I love Paul. 
I think if Paul was here today, he'd be doing what I'm doing. I'm not saying that I'm like Paul, but he says the same type of thing. He's war- He's the one who warned all the Christians about the false teachers and about the law and told us about grace and what it means to be saved. Verse 10, excuse me, chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Now remember, this is Paul, the Jew's Jew, the Pharisee of Pharisees. His desire for Israel is they might be saved. Remember, Israel was the most religious people on the face of the earth. And that Mormonism is a modern-day Pharisee. Saved. That's a good New Testament word. Don't ever be ashamed of that. For I bear them record, verse 2, that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Verse 4, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to every one that believeth. Boy, that's that's my Mormon people right down the line. They have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. And they're out there trying to get themselves cleaned up because they have been told that no one clean thing can enter the kingdom of God. And they're scrubbing themselves like crazy. And they're doing it in ignorance because they are ignoring the righteousness of God that is in Christ Jesus. And that's the only way you get clean because... I agree with them. No unclean thing will enter the kingdom of God. The big issue is who does the cleaning. And it's my Jesus that cleans me. And their Jesus does nothing for them. They have to clean up their own act. And they're going to go into a Christless eternity unless we tell them that their Jesus is not the real thing. They need to be saved. Oh, like I told you earlier... There's a couple in there. There's a few that are saved. But again, it's in spite of, not because of the system that they're involved with. They need salvation. False doctrine, number 20. This is probably the most important point. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 14. The lesson we learn here that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in in wait to deceive. And he goes on and says that we, we speak the truth in love. False doctrine. We have got to watch out for false doctrine. And with possibly only one exception, the physical resurrection of our Lord and the physical resurrection of the body, Mormonism is completely false doctrine. Oh, it appears to be okay on the surface. But when you get past that redefinition or that new definition of what the word means, it's completely changed it. You know, what if we redefine the words yes and no? That from now on in this church, church, yes means no and no means yes. And you're out riding around with somebody. And you're coming up to a a bridge. And he asks you, is the bridge all right? Is it safe? I mean, we had those floods last last, uh, February. And you look at it and you smile and you say, yes. And you continue on. But you mean no. You're going to wind up in the riverbed. This is what happens with false doctrine. They've redefined these terms so that these people who think they're following Christ are going to wake up dead and find out that they're in a Christless eternity. You know, it really does matter what you believe. Oh, not on the minor stuff. You know, sprinkle, dip, or pour. Whether you use graham crackers or white bread or Syrian bread for communion. Whether you use grape juice or wine or Coca-Cola. But if you have the wrong Jesus, it really does matter what you believe. You know, Jesus said in John chapter 8, unless you believe that I am taking the divine name on himself, you'll die in your sins. 
You know, eternal life, life with Christ for eternity, is a function of belief. If you believe the right thing, if you believe who Jesus really is and what he really did when he was nailed to that tree, then you have eternal life. And if you don't believe that, you're damned already. So false doctrine is not just a matter of, well, they're sincere, uh, they'll get by, just because they're wrong. That's true on the minor leagues, but not on the majors, not on who Jesus is and what he did. Eternal life is a function of belief. Eternal death is, too. If you don't believe the right things, you're going to wind up with eternal death. Now, I've said time and again that they have the wrong Jesus. They do. They do. You know, word meanings have suffered greatly in the last few years. You know, when I was in high school, at Christmas time, we used to sing, Don, we now are gay apparel. The word gay meant something, you know, frivolous or happy. Not today, not in 1978. When you talk about gay, you mean something that's anything but gay. You mean a person who is really miserable, not gay. You know, that's happened to the word Christian in the last couple of decades. You know, for many, many centuries, Christian was very specific. A Christian believed certain things about Christ and how he related to him. And in today's society, for all intents and purposes, Christian means non-Jew. Even an atheist can be a good Christian guy. You know, we use it like an adjective. Well, that's not the Christian thing to do or the Christian ethic. Yes, an atheist can have the Christian ethic, but that doesn't make him a Christian, and that doesn't give him eternal life. Christians believe specific things, and we need to tell people what they should believe. Again, it's not on the minor. It's on the major. You know, I've, I've said, and I, I admit it readily because I love them and they're my people, Mormons are good people. But you know, goodness doesn't save. And in fact, the goodness that we're talking about is highly relative. You know, goodness today is really the absence of obvious evil. I mean, the people in this room are good, definitely relative to Adolf Hitler. But that doesn't make you righteous in the eyes of God. Only one thing does that, and that's the blood of the cross. And that's what these people deny, the blood of the cross. The Mormons are lost, and they need to be saved. We can help save them. Not that we're going to do it. No, no. We're going to fulfill the prime directive, the great commission. Go out and make disciples. Tell them the good news. You know, gospel means good news. And the good news is that you don't have to work at your salvation with fear and trembling. You don't have to scrub yourself clean. You just have to go to the right place and to the right person. That's Jesus. That's how you get the righteousness that you're trying so hard to get. And you know, it's, it's not a suggestion on our part as Christians. It's a command. Jesus didn't say, well, when you feel like it, maybe you'd like to go on out and tell a few people in the world about me. No, 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 no. He said, go. And that's not new instruction. Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 18 says, When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not a warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thine hand. And he says, God says the same thing in chapter 33 of Ezekiel. Now, this is not that you're going to have the blood of every Mormon on your hand. This is a principle. Again, we've been discussing scriptural principles that we can learn from. And we, it's, you know, it's not a, well, if I feel like it today, I'll, I'll warn the wicked. If you just look for the opportunity to witness. And don't get hung up on this judge not lest you be judged. You know, every time you talk about some you talk to somebody, anybody, about Jesus, you have already evaluated their spiritual condition. That's not judgment. Judgment is looking at a person and saying, Ugh, I don't like him because he's a Mormon or I don't like that person because they're black. That's being judgmental. That's what Jesus was talking about in Matthew chapter 7 when he said, take that big fat log out of your eye 
before you worry about the little small mote in your brother's eye. And you know, that's the same chapter he told us in verse 15 in Matthew 7. To watch out for the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves, and you'll know them by their fruits. He was telling us to judge, to test. Judge is the wrong word. We're to test. And when I test the doctrines of Mormonism, I wind up seeing the doctrines of devils. It's not the doctrine of Christ. You know, 2 John 10 says that they don't bring the doctrine of Christ that you don't let them in here. You don't let them up to this pulpit and let them teach their damnable heresy. Now, that's the teachers and that's the leaders. They've just got tons of people out there, lovely people. And I can tell you, I met another ex-Mormon couple for the first time yesterday. And we were talking about this very thing, that when you have a zealous Mormon who will knock on the door for the gospel of Joseph Smith and Brigham Young, and you introduce them to the real Jesus, they'll go back to that door and kick it down for Jesus. That's the kind of people you can fill up this building with. Go out and tell them the truth. You can always give your testimony, if nothing else. You don't have to study a lot about Mormonism and really get into it, because it is not for the faint-hearted or the baby Christian to get into the level that I'm involved with. But you sure got a pair of knees, and you got a mind and a heart and a soul, and you can pray. Remember I said that I was prayed out of Mormonism? I was. I was prayed out of Mormonism by people who didn't even talk to me about it. So don't ever, ever, ever underestimate the power of prayer. And you've got that power. And you can get a prayer ministry going that will just turn this whole area upside down. And I say do it. Do it. I just praise God that Christians cared enough to tell me the truth. You know, this is not minor stuff. You're talking about eternal consequences. There's people out there dying in their sins every day. And there's 400 to 600 people every day joining in with them. And they're joining in because people aren't warned. People aren't warned. There's people in this congregation, I don't even have to take a poll, who are mad at me for being here, saying that Mormons are Christians. I know, uh, I can't walk into any church where I'm not going to offend somebody just by being there and come with this kind of message. But people need to know the truth. I just wish to God that somebody had told me 14 years ago the truth about it. I might have been able to save an awful lot of heartache and a side trip through the where I went and the hell that I went through. And if nothing else, if only one person in this congregation who might hear this tape in Australia or Europe does not join Mormonism because of what I've said, then I can die tonight a fulfilled Christian. Just one soul. I just praise God for the chance to come here. I do. You know, pastors get in trouble when they invite people like me to come around because we have a message that some people don't want to hear. I'm a, I apologize if I offend, but I don't apologize in offending, because the message I give is truth. It's out of the Word of God, and I have lived through this hell. I know what it's like. Nothing like talking to an Alcoholics Anonymous type to learn what being drunk really means. And I'm a spiritual Alcoholics Anonymous. This is tape R51. Why Mormonism is Not Christian by Bob Whitty in the Ex-Mormons for Jesus Tape Library. This tape is not copyrighted, and we encourage local reproduction for personal church or library use. For further information, you may contact Ex-Mormons for Jesus by writing EMFJ Ministries, Post Office Box 10177. You have been watching the Come Home to Jesus television ministry with Canada's preacher man, Dr. Max Solbrecken, who has proclaimed the Word of God across the world for 50 years without fear or favor of man or devil. Ask for Canada's revival magazine, The Cry of His Coming, when you write. 
Invest in souls by supporting this end time ministry. Please contact Max Solbrecken at MSWM Box 44220, RPO Garside, Edmonton, Alberta, T5V 1N6, Canada. Oh, die again and